to um, we'll, we'll be hopefully will be welcome to the workshop. Hopefully, we'll be able to provide you with as much as as, as, as much useful information as, as, as possible. So, I guess let us introduce ourselves. So, quickly about myself, I graduated from Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan, where I studied uh, interpreting. Uh, and then I also did an Erasmus Plus um, program at Swansea University for, for one semester. Uh, currently, I'm not working with interpreting so much, but I do have the experience of being the interpreter uh, during MUS in 2017, as well as uh, being interpreter in MEU Warsaw in 2019. Uh, so that's myself, pretty much. Uh, hello, everyone. We're very happy to have so many of you here. And if anyone would like to turn their camera on so we know that we're not just talking to each other, that would be great. Thanks, Anis. Um, my name is Andrea. I was the interpreter coordinator at MUS 2020 and interpreter coordinator assistant at MUS 2019. And I also took part at MUS as an interpreter in 2017 with Marek, incidentally. Um, I also studied translation and interpreting at university, and I'm currently a freelancer in translation and interpreting. And uh, without further ado, we'll just start. So, Marek. Yeah, all right. So uh, let's kick it off with, with the basics. Uh, so basically, there's this, this, uh, when it comes to terminology, we're not going to flood you too much with, uh, with, with a, lot of, a, lot of the, a lot of this. But uh, there's, uh, there's a basic uh, distinction that uh, many people don't realize between translation and interpreting. So um, oftentimes, we use the, people use the term translation, right? So uh, people, people, uh, people colloquially say that there are translators in the booths, uh, etc. Whereas, uh, whereas this is something that should be uh, should be clarified uh, from the get go that what we're talking here is not so much about translators, translation and translating, but we're focusing this workshop uh, on interpreting interpreters and interpretation. So what we did during our MEUs, uh, ME, MEUs uh, was uh, was actually uh, doing interpreting, and we were interpreters. We weren't so much translators, although. It did happen for us uh, to, uh, at least for me, to that I did some trans uh, that I did a piece of translation or two pieces of translation during one uh, during one simulation. So when it comes to interpreting, obviously, what is uh, the most appropriate and the most attractive way of interpreting for the MEU seems to be simultaneous interpreting, because because obviously you get lots of uh, lots of people in the uh, in the room on the floor speaking, and it's it's the best if you can actually hear the interpretation, obviously, at the very moment uh, or with a three second delay uh, after, after the speaker in your, um, in, your, in your headset. And this is uh, something that's ideal. It works amazingly in MEU Strasbourg as Andrea will, 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 uh, will describe it a little bit later uh, because everybody actually gets the interpretation um, almost immediately, right? But uh, but then aside for uh, simultaneous interpreting, it is nice. It would be nice uh, to actually think about other possibilities and what also can take place uh, in those uh, simulations. So one of the one of the one of the modes that also ha happens pretty much in all MEUs where when you have interpreters involved, as far as I'm concerned, is consecutive interpreting. So that's the situation. Consecutive interpreting. That's a situation when one speaker says something in a, in, a, in a certain language. So let's say there's a speaker who delivers a speech in, um, in Italian, and then there's an interpreter who waits for two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, probably not more than six or seven minutes. And then after those six or seven minutes, the interpreter takes over and delivers interpretation. Um, so, you, so obviously you could, you could you could wonder how how come that the interpreter remembers everything. Um, don't worry, uh, this is what we what we are trained in. So we, we try to so we try to take notes obviously during the speech, uh, and then we based based on our notes we try to deliver as accurate interpretation as possible. Um, 
when it comes to consecutive inter interpreting, it might happen for you that you would actually be interpreted consecutively. Uh, it is it is important to uh, just just have a word with the interpreter prior to the interpretation because you want to actually establish the uh, the duration of the segments, right? Because you might you might speak for one minute, the interpreter might take over. You might want to speak for three minutes and might want the interpreter to take over. So, so all in all, I guess this, this will be a recurring issue here during our workshop. I guess when you work with the interpreter. Marek, I think there's something wrong with your connection. I don't know if anyone yes, else can confirm uh, or whether it's me. Yes, Andrea. Could you please, could you please take over? I'll be back in one minute, please. Okay. So in the meantime, I'll I'll continue with something else. Um, so um, Marek will finish his section in a minute. Um, but in the meantime, I thought I could tell you how interpreting works at MUS. Um, as you've probably heard, um, at MUS, we have the, the, the biggest interpreting team and the biggest, let's say, display of interpreting. Um, we usually have between nine and 11 different languages that we can offer on top of English. And our interpreting team is usually around 27 people because we have three interpreters per um, language, per target language. So for each of their mother tongues, we have three. So for example, we would have three in people interpreting into German, three people interpreting into French, three people interpreting into Italian, and so on. Um, obviously, we are very lucky that we can do that because we have, well, we do it at the European Parliament in Strasbourg, which has the best facilities and uh, the best booths and so on. And we really don't need to worry about how to make everything work from a technical perspective. Um, which means we can focus on other things like having a big team for a big group of participants as well. Also, um, because the MUS organizing team is so large, we can have two interpreters coordinators working all year to prepare interpreting at the at the um, simulation for the week. Um, however, it also means that we're under more pressure to do it well because we are under the scrutiny of the, the European Parliament and um, the other EU institutions that we want to cooperate with or the professional um, associations of interpreting who are quite strict about working conditions and things like that. But we'll, we'll come back to that uh, later on when we talk about how you can incorporate interpreting into your MUS, uh, into your MU. And um, I'll give back to Marek so he can finish the introduction. Yes, of course. Yeah? Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys, for that. I don't expect any more surprises, so hopefully they don't happen. Uh, so what? So I would I basically all in all, what I wanted to say is that whenever you work, you work with the interpreter, or you are going to be interpreted, just make sure you guys talk to each other and you establish how exactly you want you want it to take place, uh, and when, especially when it comes to consecutive interpreting. Uh, and then, uh, because obviously you want to make the job easy for the interpreter, I mean, as easy as possible for the interpreter, because then when it's easy for the interpreter, he or she will be able to deliver as accurate interpretation uh, as possible, and that's to the best of your, advan uh, of your advantage. All right, and then uh, another other forms of interpreting would be whispered interpreting, uh, would be whispered interpreting, um, sight interpreting, and relay interpreting. So let me just quickly talk about the three of them. Whispered. Uh, it actually does happen in uh, in MEUs, and I actually had the experience of inter uh, interpreting by whispering during uh, the one in Strasbourg. So it does come in handy when, let's say, there is one person uh, in the room who doesn't uh, who doesn't speak the language that everybody else speaks, and then you just have the interpreter uh, whispering the interpretation in somebody's ear, pretty much, right? Uh, so that's uh, that's a great uh, that's a great thing to to take advantage of, especially when you uh, when there's uh, when there are only a few people who don't understand the language, or when you don't have the equipment, right? Because obviously the biggest problem, as you will as you will probably as you probably know, or you as you as you will see, is that when it comes to simultaneous interpreting, uh, we always struggle to um, oftentimes we struggle to have the equipment and to be able to utilize it. 
as as uh, as we would like to. And then when it comes to whispered interpreting, you don't need any equipment for that, obviously. Uh, site interpreting, I don't think it happens a lot. So basically, this means that uh, you could want you could give a piece of uh, of a text uh, to you could give a text to an interpreter, and he or she would basically just read it in a different language. Uh, and then the the big thing is relay interpreting. So what is relay? Uh, for, for for those of you who who haven't heard about it before. Um, so some people don't realize and don't even think about it. Uh, in a, don't think about the full picture, and don't th uh, and how the interpreting works. So just imagine when it comes to Strasbourg, let's say. Uh, when I was in Strasbourg with Andrea in 2017, I, I believe we had seven or nine interpreting booths. So that means there were uh, nine. All right, there you go. So there were actually a lot of languages, right? Uh, Slovak, Czech, Spanish, Italian, and I'm not going to name all of them because I don't want to miss any of them. But anyways, there are nine languages. And as you can imagine, when uh, so it is it is a pretty, uh, I mean, it is, I don't know if it's complex or not, but it is, but there is some complexity to it because let's say there is a speaker on the floor who speaks Italian and then you are Polish and you're sitting on the floor and you hear Polish in your ear. So what's going on? Am I? The Polish interpreter interpreting from Italian to Polish. Mm, I don't speak. I don't speak Italian. I'm not doing that. So what actually happens is the interpreting booth. So the interpreting. Uh, so the Italian interpreter actually is listening to the Italian person speaking. They interpret into English. I listen to the English of the Italian interpreters, and from their interpretation, I'm interpreting this to Polish, right? So it's a, so it's a, so it just come goes in so in stages so to speak so uh, so uh, when it comes to uh, so in your situations uh, i assume most of you probably uh, are probably meps or you take up the roles uh, on the floor other roles on the floor what's important is to bear in mind that uh, that there is uh, just a slight delay right because because uh, obviously the italian interpreter let's say has a two or three second delay interpreting from italian to english and then I'm listening to the English, which is already two seconds delayed. And I'm, uh, I probably need, let's say, one and a half or two seconds uh, uh, to add to this delay. So the Polish interpretation or the Czech interpretation, the Turkish interpretation comes probably with a four and a, four and a half minute, uh, four and a half second delay. So if you say a joke and nobody laughs, you just need to uh, just be patient uh for five seconds and hope that the joke is uh that the joke actually comes uh actually makes people laugh a little bit later etc uh, etc et uh so all right so that's when it comes to different modes of interpreting and now the big question why why have why why have interpreting at meu so uh we talked about it with andrea and we think there are three uh, main reasons for it so number one uh when we want you uh, I guess one of the aims uh, of the MEU uh, and BETA uh, uh, is to actually um, engage as many people as possible, uh, not to exclude anyone and to give the opportunity, the opportunity of participating in the simulations to every uh, EU citizen. And suffice it to say that not everybody uh, speaks English, not everybody understands English. So then when you have the interpreter, you actually make it possible for people who whose English is not very strong to fully participate in the simulation uh, as, uh, and because they can actually speak their own language and they're going to be understood by others as well as they're going to be able to understand everybody that's that is said by others uh, via the via the headsets uh, so in so the inclusion argument is I think uh, the strongest here but then on the other hand uh, from the perspective of interpreters, it is oftentimes an amazing opportunity to actually give it a shot with interpreting because there's not many opportunities out there. And MEU is, uh, is a situation which is actually very close to, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's very close to the, to the, real, uh, to the real setting. And for interpreters, uh, this is uh, one of very few opportunities to actually uh, interpret professionally in a way outside of the uh, ivory tower of the academia and uh, the EU institutions 
do need interpreters, obviously, because interpreters are in uh, are a huge uh, are a huge part of the uh, of what's going on in the European Union. Many MEPs don't 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 uh, don't speak English, right? Uh, and uh, we, are, I think, so that that's also a goal of the society, of the of the of the organization, probably to actually make sure that people are ready to take part in this process, not only from the uh, from the position of a of a politician, but also uh, for interpreters who who play a vital role in the in, in this process. And then um, on top of that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think that having the interpreters adds a lot to the realism of the entire experience so in a way an meu obviously is not uh, obviously uh, what what is voted uh, through during meus obviously doesn't become a law right uh, we would love it to become a law but uh, there is still uh, but it, it doesn't and then uh, if if uh, it's but the 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 fun and the the learning process that the participants actually get from participating in MEU, um, it derives a lot from the realism of the experience. And I think it becomes even more realistic uh, when you've got the interpreters and you see, and you actually, as, an, uh, as a politician, you commissioner, MEP, uh, you, le you actually learn, uh, learn what it is like to work with interpreters. That's a great preparation uh, for, for the future. And uh, it works well for everybody it works well for 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 those who are meps it works amazingly for those who are interpreters and it's a win-win situation as far as i'm concerned All right okay so moving on uh from the general introduction to interpreting to the more specific of interpreting at um various MEUs. Um, I already started introducing um, interpreting at MUS, so I will not go back to that. But just so you have an idea of how it actually works and what we actually offer from the interpreting service, let's call it at MUS, um, we mainly focus on simultaneous interpreting. Um, as Marek explained, that's the best for big debates, uh, where you have lots of people speaking with lots of different languages and where you cannot take the time to have a repeat of every, every speech in another language after every single speech. So at the EP plenary and at the council, we have booths and we have interpreters working in teams of three to interpret everything that is said. Um, we work with the relay system, as Marek explained. Marek, maybe you can show the picture here just so it helps everyone understand. Yeah, let, me see if I, let me see if I can do it. Um, but basically, we, we ensure that all languages are covered by going via English, which is known as a, there you go, as a pivot language. So this is more or less the situation that we would have at MUS, but with 10 boots or 11 or nine, depending on, on the year. Um, our interpreters are mainly working at the EP, but we also uh, send them to the council for a few sessions during the week as well, so ministers can also experience it. And we offer the other modes, so whispered or chuchotage interpreting and consecutive interpreting as an on-demand service. Basically, that means that any MEP minister and organizer, because organizers are very keen on these things, uh, can approach us uh, coordinators and say, hey, I would like to have um, consecutive interpreting for this statement that I'm making at the council. And then we send an interpreter with them so they can get consecutive interpreting. Or I would like to have Shushatash for a while during this session. So we send someone to do, sorry, whispered interpreting for them for one session. And it's just cool because for example, with Shushatash or whispered, I think it makes people feel very special. Like they're, uh, yeah, risk confirms, good. <laughs> uh, like they're a head of state on an important diplomatic mission and they have their interpreter by their side, always whispering in their ear what's going on. So it really is a very cool experience experience, it adds to the realism, as Marek said, and it's also really fun. Um, so, so much for how it works. Um, oh, just another thing. Um, we also use consecutive interpreting for 
kind of more solemn or special occasions. So for example, at MUS, those of you who have taken part will know, we have um, social events in the evenings. And for example, we've been received at the Strasbourg City Council, um, where a representative of the mayor gave a speech in French. And then one of our interpreters interpreted it consecutively for everyone who was in attendance. So that was quite a cool experience for the interpreters as well, because, you know, Know, they can go back to their uni or whatever and say I interpreted at the city council in Strasbourg which is quite fun I think um, and other than adding to the realism and the fun I think it's fair to say that everyone loves interpreting at MUS uh, the participants love it because it adds to realism it makes them feel special and it's quite cool to see if you've never heard interpreting before or you have never yourself been interpreted before it's quite a cool experience and the fact that participants can or interpreters rather can interact with other participants makes is is a win-win situation as mark put it because it brings our profession closer to normal people uh, so that we can present it and we can make everyone understand that it is important but it cannot be, you know, in any um, random way. It needs to follow some some conditions, some um, some rules, let's say. And then at the at the same time, um, participants really get to promote these good practices, so that when this MP in a, in a, an MUS simulation becomes an MP in the European Parliament, they will bring with them this knowledge of, of how important interpreting is and how they should treat interpreters. Um, and also we are very lucky because we have support from all the other organizers who really love interpreting, who really love having their personal interpreter for a day and who really do everything to accommodate interpreting, no matter how picky or difficult we can be sometimes, um, they, they are always really, really helpful. However, we know that the, the situation with interpreting at MUS is like the ideal, but it's not doable at other MEUs because of the facilities that you have, the resources that you have, the number of participants that you might have. And uh, this is why we, we think that in this workshop, we could just find other approaches, other ways of incorporating interpreting onto your simulation so that it contributes something to it um, and it makes it better for your participants and also gives an opportunity to interpreters. So um, for example, MU, other MUs that have had interpreting are for example Paris, Granada, Yashi, Warsaw. So we'll just give you an overview of how that went. Uh, so Marek, do you want to explain MU Warsaw? Yes, thank you. Uh, so actually, yeah, just very briefly on uh, briefly on how it worked uh, in Warsaw in comparison to Strasbourg, for example, where, as Andrea said, Strasbourg is a, is a dreamland for interpreters because the entire equipment is there. Probably that in Strasbourg, we probably get the best interpreting uh, what equipment in the world compared to NATO, etc. Right. So uh, so uh, when it comes to the the, uh, the conference in Warsaw, where which had obviously much uh, much more limited cap uh, capacity. Um, we uh, the sorry the the simulation place at university at the University of Warsaw, and interpreters had only two booths compared to yeah a, a few dozen uh, in the in Strasbourg right. So we had only two booths. So how so actually the the example of Warsaw will show you that even if your equipment is limited, you are able to come up with a solution that's going to work out. So we had six interpreters. Since the event took place in Poland, there were a lot of Pol Polish participants. Um, most There were mostly Polish interpreters. So there were three people, uh, myself included, who interpreted from English uh, to Polish and vice versa. And there were also three other interpreters uh, who could interpret uh, to French, Spanish, and Italian. So six of us all together. Uh, there was the Polish booth, in short, and there was uh, the booth uh, which consisted of other uh, other interpreters. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think I don't think it makes a lot of sense to go into all the technicalities how it worked in terms of you know uh, who would interpret when and so on. But as you can imagine, it was a little bit more complicated because we had to switch channels. 
based on which language we wanted to uh, we wanted the floor to listen to etc but uh, but it was it was but it did work out and um if you if you organize you, you know the, the the interpreting team they should surely be able to uh to work out even if the resources will be as limited as having two booths basically so i guess that's all i wanted to say when it comes to warsaw at this point thank you and but you you might think that facilities can be even more limited than having two booths like they did in Warsaw. And for example, in, in Granada, as far as I know, but if anyone here is involved with MU Granada, they can correct me. Uh, you feel the floor to uh, feel free to take the floor at any time. Um, they had portable booths. Um, that's an option always worth looking into. Uh, they are um, just booths that you can install in any room that they can that they that there's no booth in and um, you have that and then some portable headsets that you hand out to participants so they can connect to uh, the interpreters in the booths. And um, in Granada, as far as I know, there was only Spanish English going both ways, but I think that's already really, really good because you have the local language and then you have a vehicular language for everyone else, a, a kind of Esperanto that everyone will speak and understand to a degree if they don't speak Spanish. Um, and interpreting that was done in collaboration with the interpreting school at Granada University, which is one of the best in Europe. Um, and I think it's worth looking into such options, establishing partnerships with, with local universities offering interpreting studies, because well, one, you will get help from them, and two, you will give students the opportunity to interpret at an event with a great degree of realism, like Marek said. Um, so as you can see, we have different levels of, of interpreting, not quality-wise, it's, it's always very good. What I mean is how much you can invest into into that. I see we're getting a question in the chat, which is very timely because we were about to move on to our more interactive part. Um, we thought that before we give you some, some tips and some specific advice of things to take into account if you want to introduce interpreting at your MEU, that perhaps you could tell us about the circumstances at your events, since we're not familiar with all of them, and perhaps together we can help you imagine um, how to go about it. So we can start with Fernando, who shared his. I will just read what he said. Uh, what is your advice for branches that want to start using interpreters at MEUs? For example, in Portugal in February, we organized MEU Coimbra with interpretation. We had five interpreters in five booths for four languages using simultaneous consecutive, and we also had the relay. We started a cooperation with Interpreting School of Coimbra, and it was a really cool experience. People loved it and was the most valued role in the conference. Well, I'm not surprised. Um, it sounds really great. Um, I reading this, I cannot imagine what kind of advice uh, you would need. I'm curious to know what languages you were offering and which booths you had. So I don't know if you want to take the floor perhaps and tell us a bit more about that. Maybe not, okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead, please. What, what was, on, was on muting uh, my phone. So the language that we had, we had Italian, uh, we have English, uh, French and um, Spanish, if not mistaken. And how many interpreters did you have? Uh, we had we had five interpreters. One of them was um, was an Italian. That's why we had the, the Italian interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, we had also the interpretation from English to Portuguese, since mm -hmm. uh, part of our participants were from were not Portuguese and the national, mm -hmm. uh, the national language for our MU was Portuguese. Great. Um, I think that sounds like a very good setup um, and it shows that you can do a lot without that many, uh, that many interpreters. Um, I'm curious, did you have booths in the, in the room that you were using? Yes, uh, in the auditorium we had five, uh, five booths that were being used mm -hmm. and for our participants they had um, the headset uh, that were that was uh, mobile. Okay, um, that that sounds great. I think it's a it's a very good setup. Um, 
I think that's a very good place to start. For example, thinking about what languages you, you want to offer. Um, as we, we said when discussing Granada, having the local language plus English seems like the, the minimum and what makes most sense and will just open up your possibilities regarding participants. But then you can also add other languages based on um, not so much what interpreters offer, but also um, the, the participants or the countries that you have most participants from. So I guess Spanish was popular because it's a, it's a neighboring country and I, I'm imagining lots of Spanish participants. Um, it's also a popular language. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, that's really great. Uh, so your interpreters were all students from Coimbra School? Uh, not not all of them. Uh, some mm -hmm. were participants from Europe that wanted to participate in MU Coimbra. Okay, great. We had the the, uh, the interpreter role available for everyone, for anyone that was interested, and we, we got some, uh, some participants that wanted to uh, to try. That's that's great. See, that's another thing you can get participants to to try interpreting we don't encourage it during actual debates um but it, because of the realism aspect but um it's another way of presenting the profession to young people who might want to take up interpreting in the future the mu participants are you know multilingual with a, a desire for travel and getting involved in international relations and that kind of thing and interpreting is a is a great career if you're so inclined so it's um we really see it as a way of being ambassadors of of interpreting i don't know marek if you want to add anything to coimbra may i ask something please yeah sure go ahead uh, so if participants let's say from albania or, or from kosovo which are uh, countries in Europe, but are not part of the European Union. They're not members of the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, can the participants from these countries apply as interpreters in, let's say, MU Strasbourg, uh, MU Brussels, MU Lisbon, MU Warsaw? Mm -hmm. Because Albanian is not an official language, obviously, of the European Union, because Albania nor Kosovo aren't part of the EU. So mm -hmm. can, uh, can, can, can participants from these countries apply as interpreters and interpret from English to Albanian? Mm -hmm. Okay. And vice versa. That's a that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's a language, of course. It's a language, Anis. Of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, we won't deny it's a language. Uh, at MU Strasbourg, interestingly, one of our more or le more or less permanent booths is Turkish booth, and Turkish is not a European language. Turkey is not a member of the EU, um, but we have been offering it consistently for the last few years, and it's it's always been very popular. Uh, the problem with smaller languages in the sense of with fewer speakers overall is that it's it's a bit hard to make it add up. Um, for example, we can have Turkish interpreting, for example, because we always have many Turkish participants. However, for uh, for it to make sense to have an Albanian booth, for example, or interpreting into Albanian, you would need someone to listen. So. That would definitely... There are Albanian Kosovars uh, participants in every MU Strasbourg and in, in every MU Brussels. I mean, not that much like Italian or French or German, but yeah, but that's a problem. Usually three, four, five, sometimes six maximum. Fair enough, and we would love to have all the languages. However, you know, if we have twenty Italian participants, we obviously have to prioritize bigger languages with lots of participants, and we don't we don't have infinite resources to have all the languages and it's not just about the participants we also struggle to find interpreters um at the us we we are quite um let's say demanding of the interpreting qualifications we because we wanted to be not just a professional environment for interpreters to practice in, but also professional level interpreting being offered. So we always um, we're always in contact with interpreting schools from all over Europe or some people from outside Europe as well. And um, our interpreters are all of them students of interpreting or graduates from interpreting. And the problem is that not all countries have interpreting schools. For example, not not just because of I don't know lack of interests or resources or need, uh, but also because in many countries there's virtually no interpreting. For example, even in the context of the European Parliament, 
there's barely any Danish. Danish MEPs never speak Danish to the point that the Danish interpreting school has shut down because what was the point, you know? I disagree with what was the point, but that was the that was like the the reason given. So, you know, it would be great to have all the languages, but it's hard to find enough participants, find enough interpreters. Um, so I don't see it happening at MUS in the so in the near it. future. Yeah. However, at at ME, at MUS in the in the region, I think it makes all the sense in the world if you're to have all the regional languages if you expect participants from from those who speak those languages got it so that means that if uh, if a student has graduated from uh, english language interpreting university in let's say albania and there are five albanian participants in mu strasbourg that person cannot apply as interpreter is that what you mean no i don't mean that uh, we always have applications from many um, many different languages but we cannot always have them because we need three very good interpreters because interpreters always work in yeah, teams of say, three at MUS because that's a professional to... rule and we need enough participants for it to make sense so yeah. it's it's like a collective thing if there are not enough collectively we just cannot do anything about it okay but what if the, all the three interpreters have graduated from interpreting uh, faculties at their respective countries can I also add to this? Andrea? Yeah, Reese, Reese, go ahead. So uh, just to give some insight, because I don't want to make this conversation about NUS solely, because they're interpreting at so many different conferences, but as I think you're directing it towards NUS, when it comes to the applications, for example, um, when it comes to the amount of participants we select, we take that into account, as well as the amount of interpreters we've received for a specific language. So for example, last year I was responsible for selecting the participants we had. And in the end, the amount of Albanian participants we had in comparison to, for example, the amount of interpreters we had available, which as far as I'm aware, Andrea, last year in the case of Albania was not sufficient to actually have a booth, which is sometimes the case, but maybe that's, I don't know, Andrea, you know that. But the point is, is that ideally we'd have all languages, you know, we'd be able to interpret into so many languages. But if you have more participants of a certain language, if you have more interpreters applying from a certain language, every year it can change. So maybe next year we'll have Albanian. I'd love to see it. But of course, I think last year, unfortunately, that just wasn't, it didn't make sense. And we have eight to nine other languages, more interpreters applying and more participants. But anyway, I'd rather not focus on MUS. So apologies for my intervention. No, no, that's all right, please. And just to close this, this topic, uh, we change the languages that we offer every year. Some are always there. For example, French, German, Italian, Spanish are always there. But other languages change all the time. For example, for MUS 2020, we thought we would have a Greek booth, for example, but we didn't get enough Greek interpreters, so we couldn't do it. Um, so it changes all the time depending on the applications that we get. So to sum up, applications are not close to anyone, but they just need to match the number of, the, of participants for it to make sense. Um, however, we will Thank have, we, no worries, um, most happy to answer that. Um, we thought that this section of the of the seminar would be more about encouraging you to get interpreting at your MEUs and hearing what your needs are at your various MEUs. So I don't know if anyone else is considering it and would like to tell us what their circumstances are, um, perhaps we can help. I guess Nadia is having a question. Are you having a question, Nadia? Uh, yeah, I had a quick question about mm -hmm. the, the last subject, if that's okay. Um, the question was that um, if an interpreter applies and he does have the, the skills, but at the end, there are not, just not enough participants, just not enough interpreters for to make a team, then the application gets rejected, not because the interpreter is not good enough, but just because there won't be a team to interpret that mm -hmm. language. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. That can happen. Yeah. It's it's really sad because we often get very good applications, but we just yeah. have nowhere to put them, so to speak. Yeah, yeah but then okay, thank you. Yeah, no but then, yeah, but then Nadia, just just quick, a quick uh, recap of what I was uh, saying before. Um, but it does depend, right? Because that uh, you, that interpreter could get rejected, I guess, in Strasbourg, where where the setting is a little bit different. But for example, when it comes to Warsaw, as I said, we had three interpreters of three different languages in one booth. 
So it would have worked perfectly in Warsaw to have just one interpreter. Um, but obviously, as long as they would, there would be participants who would speak the who would speak the lingo of the interpreter. Mm -hmm. Which is why more MEUs should incorporate interpreting to give more interpreters the chance to interpret at MEUs, uh, because MEU Strasbourg cannot just do everything. And again, our system is a bit different. Um, so anyone else who would like to make any questions about their MEUs, we'll have Q&A at the end anyway. Danis? Are you raising your hand? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much for uh, the talk and the presentation. Um, I would like just to ask about one one question. It was already asked so by Nadia, and uh, the other one regarding simultaneous so interpreting. Uh, this is one of the most difficult types of interpreting so ever because I myself I speak approximately twelve languages. Well, um involved in another field which is more scientific but i have been interpreting and doing translation for different and for mm, many years we can say um what about if the simultaneous so um interpreting doesn't happen so on time because there are some participants or some speakers that speak and move from the topic to another topic so that means that they confuse the interpreter um, is there a possibility, for example, to use in that case a consecutive so uh, interpreting instead of simultaneous so uh, uh, interpreting? And the other part of the question, um, what does uh, um, you accurately so offer for the comfort of uh, interpreters? Because, for example, it's not possible to interpret within a group, so in the same room, because we cannot so hear well and the, the sound and everything. Is there a possibility to have like cabinets for everyone so they can so uh, interpret so fast? And yeah, the other question regarding the level of interpreters. Um, do you think that uh, MEU, so as you mentioned, so Andrea, it has to bring so interpreters to practice and to use so their skills and improve them because this is a very good platform so for practice. Uh, is that possible? And uh, what about if it happens and interpreters get tired because there are some participants that talk a lot and they need just an interpreter so all the time, so it's like they, they have to be accompanied so all the time so for interpreting. Yeah, I hope that I could provide useful questions. Thank you. Uh, Marek, do you want to take it or shall I? Um. No, you check over. I'll just add, add my, uh, my my two cents afterwards if, if I feel needed. Okay, sure. Um, so about I'll I'll start with um, working conditions and interpreters getting tired and and so on. Um, we think respecting interpreters' working conditions is very important. Um, at MUS, it's I think it's the 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 basis of our credibility as a, a place for interpreting practice. So as I said, I am at MUS and in the professional context, interpreters work in teams of three. So to answer your question, if an interpreter gets very tired, they always have a colleague who can take over. Um, so they never work alone. So for example, let's say. I'm in the Spanish booth and I'm interpreting. I have two other colleagues by my side. One of them is helping me actively all the time. So for example, um, in the example that you gave of a, of a speaker speaking very fast and so on, my colleagues sitting by my side would be writing things down to help me. So for example, figures, acronyms, that kind of thing, whatever that is, is more difficult to, to get. Or for example, if I make a mistake, they might write it down so I can correct myself. And the third interpreter is resting. And um, everything goes in turns. Um, each interpreting team can set their own turns, but the usual thing is to switch every 20 to 30 minutes. So I interpret for 30 minutes. At the end of it, I'm dead. I'm super tired. So I'm the one who gets to rest. The one who was resting starts working. Sorry, the one who was helping me starts working, and the one who was resting helps them. Okay. So at the in the end, you're only working for 30 minutes straight or 20 minutes straight. Um, 
that's to simplify. There are other things to take into account, but let's let's leave it at that. Um, as for the equipment, uh, that's what what you called cabinets is what we call booths. So that's what we've been um, talking about during the seminar. Some um, some rooms have built in booths. So for example, at the European Parliament or at the University in Warsaw that Marek was talking about, there are built in booths with, with a big glass window and so on. And interpreters sit there and they cannot hear anything else. They only have their headphones. Um, so they're, they're soundproof and they don't disturb other interpreters, for example. So that's very important for comfort. And um, there are also portable booths, which I mentioned, which you can get if, for example, the room that you're working at does not have built-in room, uh, built-in booths. Um, and then there's also, of course, it's important to have good microphones, good headsets. Um, and it's not just a matter of comfort, it's, just, it's a matter of health and safety as well, because, you know, interpreters work with their ears and mouth and, you know, the moment that's gone is the end of, of their career. That's very dramatic, but, you know, um, you know what I mean. Um, and about uh, simultaneous and consecutive, I didn't quite get what you mean, what you meant when you said that the speaker sp switches topics and interpreters are confused. However, uh, it's really common. Uh, we we always deal with speakers who are challenging. You know, we have wonderful speakers who can just speak about anything uh, very easily without without reading notes or anything like that. And then there are people who get more nervous or who are not as familiar with the topic or with the language or um, you know, or maybe are not as used to uh, speaking in public as other people who don't provide that very, um, uh, I don't know, fluent uh, kind of speech. So it's part of interpreting training to deal with speakers who are challenging, who change topics, who change languages even uh, without warning, who just, you know, who are given 30 seconds allocated speaking time and insist on reading two pages of text. And all those things are very important to take into account when you're organizing interpreting at an MEU. And, um, I think we can actually move up, move on to that because we're running running out of time. Um, so to end with, we wanted to to give you kind of a list of things to consider when you're organizing interpreting at your at your MEU. Um, so as we said, first it would be interesting to consider which languages you want to do. So you can do that. Um, by looking at the kind of participants that you usually get. Um, as we said, it's interesting to start with the local language and English because it's the most widely spoken language. If the, if the local language is English, then uh, think about what your biggest group of participants is, for example, or what another popular language is. So for example, German or French, um, or for example, as Fernando was saying, if you're in Portugal, then perhaps Spanish makes sense because it's a neighboring country. Um, there's no single answer for that. You just need to think about your location and your participants. And then uh, you need to think who will be interpreting? What kind of interpreting do you want to provide? As we said at MUS, we tend to have a very professional approach because we um, we want to, to be able to cooperate with the EU institutions and with interpreting schools who are very strict and rightly so about working conditions and about um, this being a, a learning experience and not unpaid work, for example, which is, you know, something that we really need to take uh, to be careful with because um, the interpreting world is just complicated when it comes to to internships and that kind of thing. So who will you get to interpret? Will you have participants who interpret? Will you establish a partnership with a local university? Uh, will you have a, a bigger call so anyone from all over the world or all over, all over Europe can apply? Um, how do you check that they can interpret, that they're good interpreters who will give something to your simulation? Um, is it very important for you that they're, you know, completely trained interpreters or would you rather give other people the chance to see if they would like to become interpreters? Um, you know, 
those are all things that are are valid and that you you need to think about then um reconnected to location yes and is i'll i'll finish with this and we'll open q a um with uh, regarding your facilities the room that you'll be using you need to look at what equipment is available to you so if you have built-in booths like in warsaw university or strasbourg then great you don't need to worry about that but if you don't have that what can you do um you can get portable booths fine that's that's really worth exploring if you have some funds to to get those that's great if not perhaps the university that you've established a partnership uh, with can help you with that and lend you some equipment or perhaps the local government or you know um an interpreting company um there are many options worth looking into but each situation is different so we really can't help with that um i mean we can give advice but we cannot say do this and that um if that's not possible perhaps you can still incorporate interpreting in another way. We have discussed consecutive and whispered interpreting or shushotage. Those are really fun. Uh, it would be a great opportunity if you cannot afford the time and money and you know number of participants, et cetera, needed to have simultaneous interpreting. Why not have at least consecutive interpreting do, during your opening ceremonies? You know, have your the director of your simulation give a speech in whatever their mother tongue is and have an interpreter do a consecutive rendition. It's really it's really cool. It's really fun. Or, you know, have shujotage interpreting for um, shujotage can only be done for for one or two people at at any time um, as a, as in one interpreter working for one other person or two other people. Uh, but it can still feel very special and it can be very entertaining and add to your simulation. So those are those are things to take into account, as are the working conditions that you're going to be offering to interpreters. As Anis rightly said, interpreting is really tiring. So you cannot have one interpreter working on their own for a whole simulation. It just it makes no sense. It's not good for the interpreter because they will get tired. And it's not good for your simulation because the quality will decline as the interpreter gets tired. So always uh, think about that. Always think about the team that you're going to build, the turns that they can take, how long the sessions will be. Always ensure that interpreters have enough time to take breaks. Um, and the most important thing, I other than yeah, I would I would argue it is more important than everything I've said to, until now is prepare other participants to be interpreted. Uh, this goes for chairs, especially um, because chairs will have to be like the interpreting police to to a certain degree, and they will have to ensure that people are speaking in an interpretable way, if that's a term that will we can coin uh, right now, you know, they, they must ensure that participants are speaking clearly, that they're speaking into the mic, that they're not trying to fit five pages of very dense pre-written text into 30 seconds allocated time, that they are aware that they're being um, interpreted, that, you know, there are all these things that you need to tell your other participants. And it's, it's normal, you know, most of us, uh, or, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but most participants who come to our simulations have never been interpreted before. Some of them have never even heard simultaneous interpreting before because it's not that widely available. Um, so it's just like whenever you face a new experience, you need to give, be given instructions. So it's very important not to disregard that and to prepare everyone to, to be interpreted and at the same time, encourage them to benefit from interpreting. At MUS, for example, which is a week-long simulation, on Monday, like we noticed this very big shift during the week. On Monday, everyone speaks English at the parliamentary debates, at the council debates. Why? Well, English is the official language of the simulation, but English also has status, right? If, if you speak English, you you can represent your country, you can, you know, it's a it's a matter of, um not everyone thinks that their language is important enough to compete with english or it is it happens even in the real 
European Parliament with MEPs, many, many MEPs who don't even speak good enough English, and that's not the point, uh, insist on speaking English because they feel they have to. But that really puts them at a huge disadvantage compared to native English speakers, because when you're speaking your native language, you can express anything in the world and you can you don't even need to think about how you're going to say something. However, when you're speaking a second language, third language, fourth language, whatever, no matter how good you are, there will th there will be things that you will struggle with. Um, so interpreting helps level that field. If I, as a Spanish native speaker, can speak my mother tongue, even though I'm debating with Reese, who is a native English speaker, and we we both rely on interpreting, suddenly we're level because each of us is speaking and listening to their mother tongue. And I think that's really great, um, especially to encourage people who who feel a bit um, insecure about their public speaking or their English speaking, for example. And, and it really adds to the experience. So, you know, don't just tell participants, watch out, you're being interpreted, be good to the interpreters, which is important. Also tell them, enjoy, you know, you're being interpreted, like on those roller coasters where where you have to smile for that picture, even though uh, you're suffering, you know, just just encourage it because it's a really, really cool experience that everyone can benefit from. And I would say on that bright note, and at 101, um, I'll just finish the, the our presentation, but we're still available for questions uh, from anyone on interpreting on how to encourage. Yes, Rhys? Yeah, sorry. So I thank you for that. And I agree with everything that was said, especially the last point. I feel I know you're a big often, fan. Yeah, I feel that very often participants simply are not aware um, that they have this option or a bit scared to use it. And so very important that it's encouraged. And I, the conferences I've been at, I think that's always been the case. So long may that continue. And my question is, I think a lot of the MUs we've mentioned have strong partnerships or happen to be in a city where there is an interpreting university. So for example, Granada, there was that opportunity. My understanding in Warsaw too, that's also a place where people go to study interpreting. So let's say if I wish to establish an MU in my, my rural place in Wales, uh, of which there's, as far as I'm aware, no interpreting university there. Where How would I, no, unfortunately not for Welsh, <laughs> although maybe there is, I'm not aware, but not in my town. And if I wanted it in my town, how would I go about that? How would I be able to actually establish a partnership when nobody on my team has an existing one and there is not a university around me? What would you recommend? Because I imagine that could happen to some people. So I guess uh, Andrea and myself had a had a conversation about it as well, and um, it is a problem. It is a problematic situation to some extent because um, the thing. So obviously, uh, it's always. Uh, so I, I think I think um, money is the problem here, right? Because uh, because you you wouldn't like to most people most people wouldn't like to uh, just uh, rent uh, the interpreting uh, equipment because it's uh, it's hella pricey. Uh, and uh, if, even if you look at the Polish market, as far as I'm concerned, and I did a, I did a, I did a re, I did research uh, a few days ago, it would cost uh, almost 400 euros per day, right? That's that's so much. So I guess so. I think we we talked about it, and we came to the conclusion that the only thing then, if you wanted to have simultaneous interpreting, the only way would be to actually uh, find uh, somebody who would like to partner with you and would like to contribute by actually lending this portable booth uh, but if there if if, if 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 that's not an option so you're not gonna so if, if you don't if you're not gonna have the the, uh, the portable booth uh, what could uh, potentially this is a bit more i guess risky i don't know if andrea would agree with me but it, it could happen where it could you could actually also have interpreters you know, sitting in another room, sort of without the booth, it would be good if they could see the floor at least, just to know who's raising the hand, who's talking, uh, this sort of stuff. Uh, but that actually uh, lowers the quality of the interpretation, obviously, because uh, because you're not able then to hear it as well as possible. I did attend, I did attend a conference where it was the case that actually my teacher from the school of interpreting interpreted uh, for. 30 people or 40 people by sitting in a room nearby. Uh, but then but then you still need to have this equipment 
uh, that is going to connect you to to the people so that i guess that lowers the costs because you don't have the booth itself but it's, it could still be it could still be pricey so so then the option so then the alternative for for interpreters would be to for them to do shushotage whispered interpretation and they could do consecutive interpretation and as long as it is made clear for for the participants interpreting participants uh, that they're not going to be interpreting simultaneously per se but they'll be uh, whispering the interpretation uh, if they sign up for it they might benefit immensely from it by just having this learning experience as well as you uh, as as organizers will be able then in that situation to actually provide uh, provide help in terms of interpretation for let's say two or four or six participants who just don't speak language uh, the, the language so well which is valuable for for both sides as far as i'm concerned uh, so it doesn't it doesn't then have this so you don't get this big picture of L, of everybody uh, taking advantage of it but then on an individual level people uh, there are people who can actually uh, benefit from it immensely as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may add to that, another way of downsizing, if you cannot afford equipment or lots of interpreters, is just to use interpreting as an inclusion tool. So have interpreting only for people who really, really need it in order to be involved. Um, so instead of having interpreting available for everyone via simultaneous, you can have a few a smaller interpreting team doing shushotage for people who don't speak English or who don't speak the local language that you, you're doing the simulation in. And um, I think we don't we don't really like we have been focusing on interpreting as this cool additional feature for everyone, but it actually can be used to promote more inclusion, more diversity at your simulation. And Rizu and I, for example, have spoken about sign language interpreting and that I wanted to also mention that if you, it's another mode of interpreting and it's also worth looking into it. There are also sign language interpreting students who would want to, to practice and enjoy a real life interpreting experience. And you would open up your simulation to people who are deaf or hard of, he or he hard of hearing um, and include them. So you can downsize with the equipment or you can downsize with limiting interpreting services to a few people or a few sessions or something like that. But um, about your question about universities, I, I got the impression that it wasn't just about equipment, but also where to find interpreters, right? Um, so it goes back to how professional you want your interpreting to be. Because for example, I'm sure that even in your rural Welsh area, there are speakers of other languages who perhaps would like to, to take part in your simulation, be involved with an MEU and practice their languages in such a context. So perhaps they might not have the interpreting skills yet, but it's something that they are considering. And this would be a good opportunity for them to try to see if they really like it, to see if they really could do it. So I think that's one option. Another option is contact other universities anyway. Um, you know, even if there's no one in London, there are interpreting schools in Bath, uh, sorry, not in London, in Wales, there are interpreting schools in London, in Bath, um, in other cities in the UK. So, and really, I cannot highlight this enough, interpreting students are desperate for practice opportunities because there's just nothing out there. So chances are they will still want to help you. And they will still want to, you know, make the trip on a weekend to Wales. I'm sure it's nice. Um, so I, I would say it's worth a shot. If you don't know who to contact, and this is um, um, something I was going to say anyway, you feel free to contact MUS coordinators. Um, they have the experience with organizing a very large interpreting team. They are we are but you know i'm a former now uh they they have all the connection they have contacts in all interpreting schools in europe um they know former alumni who have been interpreters at mus before who might have other contacts to recommend so you know please think of us as a source of information to help you implement interpreting because we really want it to to be extended throughout the whole network. Because as we were saying when we were answering the question about Albanian, 
we cannot do everything because we we have limited resources but we're happy to support other people in in joining this project good um anis i think you had a question i don't know if you will still have it yeah uh, thank you guys for the entertaining talk it's really very very good uh i think that you partly mentioned something from the question so andrea but i would like just to um, ask uh, if are required only interpreters or preferable those that have only background in, uh, in interpreting or that come from uh, universities that teach so this type of specialities or can everyone for example who wish to to interpret he speaks the language come and just practice so it will be fun because I think that making events very serious, especially in simulating so politics in the um, MEU, it will be boring so for participants. Is it possible to have it, for example, like that? And uh, the other part of the question, what about the level of interpreters? For example, recently in Moscow, I presented the technical presentation in petroleum engineering and I presented in English. So the interpreter was a student and he made a mistake while he so interpreted. So because there are some technical terms that were not available. So the audience understood that differently. So it's like they understood how it's like that. So I straight away so try to correct so that uh, that point. So the interpreter can learn from that and can just get encouraged so more. Uh, also, I would like to add a point that are people that take it serious when the interpreter makes a mistake. It's like they think that uh, you need to interpret, we have to hear, this is it. Uh, the other part, as you mentioned, the uh, switching from simultaneous to consecutive, if it's difficult, I think that it should be possible to switch and just have some minutes while just listening to the speaker, then we, we interpret. Also, is there a possibility to uh, for example, during um, the first part of, in the council, for example, and reading the um, position papers, is it possible to send the position papers to the interpreters so they have ideas about that and they make it easy while just interpreting from different languages? And I hope that in MEU there will be all languages, so it will be very fun. Thank you. We hope so too. That's our letter to Santa right there. Um, okay, lots of questions, uh, but I think we can we can answer them. Um, about the level of interpreting, how professional we want them, whether we are happy to have people who simply speak languages. As I said, it's something each organizer or each organizer in charge of interpreting at each MEU should think about. What kind of interpreting do you want to provide? At MUS, we are offering professional level interpreting only with interpreting students or interpreting graduates. In, in, on the one hand, because we want to make the experience as realistic as possible, offering the highest possible level of interpreting, but also because, as I said, there are very few practice opportunities for interpreting students. And the thing is that you graduate from university and it's very hard to find interpreting work as a freelancer because most interpreters work as freelancers because you don't have the experience because you have never been in a professional environment as an interpreter. So we like to, to try to bridge that gap and offer interpreting students that opportunity. And Marek, I'm sure you'll agree that it is helpful, right? It is what, it well, is something people need. Mm -hmm. However, at other MEUs, it might, might not be desirable or possible to have such standards, and that's fine. As I said in Reese's example, you might want to use interpreting at your MEU to encourage people who speak languages to take up interpreting or try interpreting. So, you know, I there's no single rule for everyone. It's, you know, do what works for you and your simulation and offer what you want to offer. Um, as for making mistakes when interpreting, we're all human, it's bound to happen. Interpreters prepare really, really hard in the professional world and at MUS. For example, 
when interpreters are recruited, recruited for MUS, there are like six or eight weeks before the conference when they're preparing all the time. They're preparing all the content, the proposals, they're learning all the vocabulary in all their working languages. They're looking at position papers and so on that they're sent beforehand. So they prepare really, really, really hard as do interpreters when they're working at the professional assignment like your um, presentation. But still, you cannot anticipate everything. Speakers sometimes quote famous philosophers. How could you know that in advance, you know? Um, sometimes speeches get really dense and really difficult. You're bound to make mistakes. And I think it's, an all, it's important to acknowledge that interpreters are not machines, that they do a very good job because they prepare very hard and for, for very long, but that there will always be mistakes. And it's important not to take them, you know, personally or not judge the quality of interpreting based on one interpretation mistake, but also take into account, you know, 99% went well, you made one mistake, it's fine, it can be fixed. Um, as for switching between simultaneous and consecutive, as far as I'm concerned, that's a no-no. If you're doing simultaneous, you're doing simultaneous. You cannot stop for a few minutes to listen and then do a consec because you stop the whole flow of the debate. Um, the EP is an extreme case, but speakers there have perhaps 30 seconds or one minute allocated speaking time. So you cannot delay the whole schedule because you cannot keep up with the, with the speed, which is why interpreting uh, interpreters train for that you know if it's consecutive it is consecutive and for consecutive the interpreter is not in the booth the interpreter is in the room with their speaker um, so for example if you have a minister giving a speech the interpreter is by the minister working with them um, so they're completely separate modes and you you cannot mix them i i would say um, if if a speech gets very dense obviously you might hold back a little bit to make sure that you are understanding but it should never become a consecutive it just it just wouldn't work and finally about the documents yes um thanks for bringing that up because i actually forgot to mention that when you're educating your chairs and participants in what interpreting is and how it works and you know encouraging them to to use it tell them as well that if they want to read something out they should send that document to interpreters first. So to interpreters, coordinators, for example, for them to distribute that because it really, really helps um, because it's going to be faster. It's going to be denser, probably some terminology there. And if interpreters have the chance of having a quick look at it beforehand, the result will be better for everyone. And, you know, some speakers don't want to give their documents before, like it's, you know, their, their secret argument to, to win the debate or anything like that. But to be honest, interpreters don't care. They just want to do the job. They, they don't care that it's a big secret. So, you know, encourage that as well as an, as an organizer. Um, and we have another question. I don't know, Marek, if you want to take it. Reese wrote it on the on the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just I, I, I've just read it. So basically, the question, as far as I understand, is um, is about the situation when there is um, when there is a new MEU and there is there's so much to take care of, and the last thing you you think about is just having yet another responsibility. Uh, and why should why shouldn't you cross out interpreting from the from the to do list? So. So I guess, uh, so I guess you shouldn't, because, because uh, then, I guess the, the important thing in such a situation is to find somebody who would like to coordinate that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if you find somebody who would be, uh, who would want to be responsible for being in charge of the interpreting team, uh, then I don't think that it would add. Um, so much to the organization of the entire MEU. So, so then, because, uh, because then basically, I guess all it would boil down mostly to would be just to making sure uh, by staying in touch with the interpreter, uh, with the in interpreting team uh, leaders that things are going smoothly. Uh, but I, yeah, but I guess it would be, but I guess it does make sense to have a separate team. Uh, so obviously, Andrea, uh, Andrea was the, the head of the team in 2000, uh, was, was, was going to be the head of the team in 2020, right? And then, and then even in Warsaw, it was a very small conference. 
we had we had a team which consisted of two ladies. Oh, by the way, one Albanian. <laughs> uh, speaking of, yeah, right. So an, an Albanian girl, a great friend, and then a Polish lady too. So they were our leaders, the leaders of the six of us participants. So they took care of everything. So in a way, it did take away from the from other organizing team members uh, when it comes to responsibilities. They didn't have to take care of those things. Uh, so I guess uh, it's it's. I don't want to. Well, I don't want to uh, paint a too you know too too bright picture of all of it. But it, it does seem doable to me. I think you can also contact interpreting schools or interpreters who might want to take part in your simulation as interpreters and ask them to be coordinators. You know, in in at at interpreting assignments you don't usually have a coordinator external to the team. You always, you usually have one interpreter who is also the coordinator, as Marek, as Marek described. So even if nobody in your organizing team can do that or wants to do that or thinks that they would do a good job coordinating interpreters, you can find someone external who, you know, home to ask, hey, we'd like to have interpreting, would you help us? Would you want to? And it's also great interpreting practice because again, you might find yourself as a professional interpreter having to be what we call chef de keep, which is the, the head of the team. And you have no idea how to do that. So at least if you did it at an MEU, you know, something might be more familiar. So I, I think it would be a cool experience anyway. And, you know, so the answer is, no matter what the difficulties, just try to get interpreting. <laughs> any any other questions or comments? Uh, I wanted to yeah to add just a comment. I think that uh, for MEUs there should be possibility to all those that speak different languages to to interpret because students that study interpreting at universities do not do and do not like to do a free job because this is one of uh, the jobs or professions that doesn't have a lot of uh, offers and of course it's expensive. Uh, I think that this is one of the points that uh, I don't know you should consider just to invite volunteers that speak different languages if you want to interpret come and of course it will be fun because all of them are students and they are not in, in, in Brussels or in Strasbourg so in reality. This is what I want just uh, to add. And uh, I think that as MEU is a volunteer so um, platform, there should be so volunteers not from universities because there are universities that don't offer so uh, the types so of, uh, of, uh, of offers, just they don't like, or uh, they offer it this time, but next time they don't want, or they have a lot of conditions that cannot so meet so the conditions of MEU or just uh, participants. And uh, yes, this is just a comment that I would like to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, as as we, we've been saying, there are various options and each MEU should find their own way of incorporating interpreters. Not everything has to be professional level, as you, as you said, and we suggested for Reese's Rural Welsh MEU, uh, <laughs> uh, you can have just people who speak various languages who want to give it a go. But if you have that, you must acknowledge that the, the level of interpreting will be different, you know? So it's, it's just about priorities, what you want to do. Um, I'm sorry to disagree with the fact that interpreting students don't want to do a free job because, you know, we get loads of applications. Just last year for 30-ish interpreting positions at MUS, we got over 160 applications, you know? Those are people who want to work, work, uh, as interpreters for free, but it's not work. It is a practice experience that we're offering, which is why we're so strict about working conditions, about uh, speakers being aware that they're being interpreted, about them sending uh, their documents in advance and so on, because we really want to offer something that's not just free work, but it's something that interpreters will benefit from, you know? and. I think just the fact that Marek and I are here three years after participating as interpreters at MUS kind of shows that it was useful for us and that it was a good experience and that we want to keep supporting it because it worked for us. So we think that other people can also benefit from it. 
Uh, right, and just uh, on that note as well, because uh, we we should be wrapping up uh, in a maximum five minutes because uh, we need a break, I guess. Yeah, you guys need a break. Uh, so just to, uh, but on, on the last note, um, when when you when you talk when you talked Anis about uh, about giving the opportunity for interpreting for other for people who are outside uh, outside the the schools for interpreters and translators translators etc. Uh, I think the from my experience, the important thing to bear in mind is that if you if you get some uh, you want to you want to have a certain proof of somebody's competence uh, at least to a certain extent. As as Andrea said, you want to basically you need to say you need to establish what level is the one that you you're going to accept. And I can tell you from my experience that if you get somebody who's not qualified enough or who's still uh, who's still not up there. Then uh, it might cause uh, so it it might um, it might cause some what not maybe not conflicts but it might there might be something wrong going on too because then people will not be uh, keen on speaking uh, their their mother tongues if they know that uh, their interpretation is going to be uh, interpreted in the wrong way that they're not going to be understood and trust me MEPs and other people on the floor they very quickly find out that something went wrong <laughs> because it's enough to have a chat have a word with somebody else and then and then they just stop they just stop speaking their mother language so what you don't want to have you don't want to end up in a situation I, I think you don't want to end up with a situation when everybody speaks english on the floor because they think that it doesn't make sense to speak their mother language mother tongue because it's basically going to be messed up right so that's something important i guess to bear in mind um on uh, also the, just next to this idealistic uh, picture of giving everybody the opportunity etc uh, and i know a lot of i know i know a few people uh, were uh, a little bit irritated at having been uh, misinterpreted too and i think on that note we will wrap up and finish uh, just to conclude i would like to encourage again all meu organizers to be in touch with mus uh, interpreting coordinators if you need anything we have given advice to other meus before when they wanted to incorporate interpreting and we'll be happy to do it again so you know you know where to find us uh, and we're there we're happy to share our resources with you um, so that's all for me. Thank you all very much for coming for all the interesting questions. And uh, Marek? Yeah, no, uh, not too much to add. So basically, if you have any questions, even post uh, post the talk, feel free to uh, to just write them maybe uh, in the chat box. I'll just type in my my email address if you if you want to contact me specifically andre i don't know if you if you're... i'll add mine as well yes yeah right so if you feel there's something there's a question that wasn't answered or maybe a question pops up in an hour and you think uh, we would be uh what we would be uh the right people to ask then feel free to do that uh thank you for being here uh hopefully it was uh, hopefully it was a, a, a 90 minutes spent well for you that's all for me yeah, thank you all very much. All right, we look forward to more interpreting at the news. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.